Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of National Board Conversations. It's the end of Black History Month and we wanted to make sure we highlight a black MCT advocating for all educators. In this episode, we travel out to LA to speak with Barry Thomas. He's an English teacher doing a lot to push the narrative on black literature in his schools. He's held a bunch of leadership positions in his department and continues to push boundaries with literature. Here's my conversation with Barry Thomas. Barry Thomas, thank you for joining me on the podcast. It's great to have you. Hey, it's my pleasure, Eddie. Thanks for reaching out. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, what is your current role? And give a brief intro of yourself. And then I got a few questions to uh, get into a little bit of personal side of you. Uh, sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, um, my current role is uh, I am an English teacher. Uh, I've been an English teacher for about uh, 11, 12 months. It's my 12th year right now. And um, I also um, I also mentor three different teachers through um, our district programs called the uh, Teacher Growth Induction Program. So when I passed the national board, there were some options and I saw that option and I thought it'd be an awesome thing to give back to other teachers and to work with them and support them. Okay, cool. cool. So what are your three favorite foods? <laughs> three favorite foods, pizza. Okay. Because my first job was at a pizza place. And so <laughs> my first jobs were at pizza shops. Like, man, we just got to make it happen. <laughs> yeah, round table pizza. It's still my favorite pizza to eat right now. Um, and then I have to go with um, shrimp. I love my love my shrimp. And then I have to go with steak. I love a good steak. Okay, okay. Three songs that describe you. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that's a tough one. I have to say, well, I'm, a, I'm a big, I'm a big MJ fan, Michael Jackson fan. So uh, one of his songs is called uh, Man in the Mirror or Make That Change or something like that. Yeah. And I like that. That one defines me because that's kind of my ethos, my philosophy. Uh, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. So that's one of them. Uh, another one, uh, I like I like a lot of kind of big band stuff like Frank Sinatra. He does a song called All or Nothing at All. And that's kind of the way I am. It's like when I when I believe something, I throw myself into it. And then there's another song, old school, old school, by a gentleman by the name of Nat King Cole. And he sang a song called Nature Boy. And a line in there says, the greatest, the greatest thing you'll ever find is just to love and be loved in return. And I think love is a um an important thing to have. Okay, okay. I'm gonna give those a check out. I was I've been thinking about big band music the last like week or so. So I'm gonna give those, I'm gonna give those a look. Yeah, my, my dad raised me on jazz, man, and never left me. So I, I go back to that old school. Okay, okay. The one sport team that has your heart. And if you're not a sports fan, one movie you can recite line for line. Yeah, um, I'm torn between my Lakers and my Rams. <laughs> that, uh, But if I had to choose one, I am a Lakers fan because one of my favorite basketball players is playing with them now, which is LeBron James. So, yeah. I'm a okay, Lakers. okay. I got my Boston Celtics shirt on. because I, I see, I, like I see. <laughs> we, we, we can still get along here, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so can you share what got you in the education? Yeah, um, I come from a long line of teachers. My my dad was a teacher. My aunt was a teacher. My sister was a teacher. Uh, and I'm sure that contributed to it. Um, but, uh, I can't, you know, I have a passion for wanting to help others, right? And I think about my education, and I had some really good teachers that made a huge impact on me, and I still remember their impact um to this day and so i want to make that kind of difference so i think all of those things contributed to it all right so you are black male in education very rare and it's becoming even more increasingly rare uh what do you think has been leading the cause behind the decline of black male educators eddie that's a fantastic question um i think well i, I know in some states right educators are not paid a lot um and um, when there's a, a black male who wants to, he has a desire to pursue his education, he, I think he leans towards those jobs that pay a lot, right? Uh, so I think, I think a financial element contributes to that. And, um, and then maybe, you know, I think, I think, um, black males need to be exposed to education, right? Because I come from a long line of teachers. I think that helped me. Um, so maybe maybe schools can do a better job at kind of having like some kind of uh, workshops or presentations about education and all the benefits that it can bring. So I think that could help. OK, OK. I try to tell people like a lot of the school, the schools I went to were not very inviting 
as a black male, right? So it would not make me to go back to work in that environment. And I think even from a young age, if you want to get them into into schools, creating a more inviting learning environment would definitely be helpful to get in more black men in the classroom as they get older and see education as a possible career path. Because it's somebody like, you'll have good memories of a place you want to go back to. Because a lot of times you're there with your friends, it's good memories, but the building is not very inviting. You're like, I don't want to work somewhere I don't feel good. That's that's a great point. And, you know, it's almost kind of like a vicious cycle. We need more Black males, but if you're in there, it's important to see someone who looks like you, right? So I think I think that makes a big difference, right? So if you don't see yourself in the instructors, that's a part of maybe not feeling as comfortable, you know, even though, you know, um, a person is who they are is who they are, right? So if you're, if you're a genuine person, you're going to make an impact, but it does help to see somebody who looks like you. No, it does. So what were you like as a student and how does that influence your style now? Yeah, you know, um, you know, my dad was strong on education <laughs> and he was a heavy disciplinarian, so I didn't dare step out of line. Uh, I participated, you know, I was respectful. And that definitely helps my style because when I'm teaching, I expect, I respect my students and I expect the same kind of respect. I expect them to involve um, because they, they, they are what makes the education um, effective, right? We need their involvement. So I expect the same thing. So that definitely affects my style and that it affects my expectations. So now you're national board certified. What pushed mm -hmm. you to pursue board certification and what was your journey like? Did you achieve on your first try? Uh, great questions. Um, okay, so what pushed me to it? When I when I when I started working at my school, Young Old Kim Academy in Los Angeles, woo, um, there was there were like three teachers who were nationally board certified who I respected immensely. They were kind of like my mentors, who I kind of was mentored by 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 far you know, from afar. I kind of watched them, even though they didn't know I was watching, right? And I said, "Wow, um, I want to be like them." So. Uh, and so I began to pursue it when I was in my um, my master's program at USC. They talked about it. So that kind of sowed a seed in my in my mind. So between that and seeing them and then hearing about the kind of like the benefits that California has for national board certified teachers, you know, they it's a 15 percent increase. And there's another stipend if you teach in a high end uh, uh, in, in an area where there's high need, they give like a $25,000 stipend for the, over the fi next five years. So there's lots of financial incentives. Uh, so those were the things that motivated me. Now my journey. Yeah. Uh, it was wonderful. It was exciting. <laughs> it was a bit of hell on earth as well. <laughs> uh, it was very intense. It was all those things. All right. All right. Hey, you got there. That's all we need. That's right. <laughs> so what was the most helpful coaching conversation or resource or advice you um, received while you were on your journey? Yeah. So those three individuals who were nationally board certified when I came to that school, they all went through a program, a UCLA program, um, and they recommended that to me. And um, so I went there and it was great. It was like other teachers. We were supporting each other. And there was an amazing um, professor there by the name of Aaron Powers. And uh, she is just fantastic. She just kind of made it all make sense because it was like a, a maze of information that she kind of had to cipher through. And so she was a great support, um, made it doable, uh, kind of made you believe in yourself. So I, I highly recommend some kind of program that's that they're aware of kind of the things you go through and they can offer a support. Also, I went online and I found resources. Um, I found um, like once I knew what was going to be on the exam, I went and um, I looked up kind of like similar things. So I would kind of like look up uh, AP exams that high schools would give and and I would kind of get that information. And then I kind of would time myself kind of responding to questions relating to those things. I kind of, I would create like test scenarios for myself as it relates to the standardized test. Uh, so that was a huge help to me. Um, and just kind of researching practices and pedagogies and standards, uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, um, pedagogies and practices that kind of um, would prepare me for what I'd see on um, the exam. It's really creative creating your own exam from almost others that are out there, like the AP exam and things like that. It's a very creative way to get ahead of what's coming. Well, I learned that in that UCLA program, right? So it, th those are the kinds of things, right, that, um, you know, you can do it on your own, and that's great. 
but for me, I couldn't imagine doing it on my own because, you know, it's, 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 it's no joke, right? You know, I, I went through some pretty strenuous programs. I thought my master's programs were the hardest thing I've, I've gone through, but this, <laughs> this was even more challenging than that. Um, but, uh, it really helps your thinking. It helps you kind of like analyze what you're doing with the students and it makes you a better instructor. And that's and for me, that's what it's all about. So it's Black History Month and I got you on for, for that reason. I want to talk a little bit of uh, Black History for this uh, podcast. So can, do you have any specific lessons that celebrate Black literary contributions and engages your students in thoughtful discussion? Yeah, yeah. I, I was speaking to one of my, my, my colleagues, that, you know, a Black instructor, and, you know, we were discussing this and, 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 and I admittedly said, you know, I do have some lessons and I'm going to share those in a moment. But um, I think that there's a lot more that I can do as, as a black educator uh, to try to reach uh, the students as well as, you know, um, my students are primarily Hispanic and as well as reaching out to them with Hispanic heroes. Right. Uh, to kind of reach those and kind of find that universal thread through it all, right? That we're all humans and 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 the human experience is important and that we can see how we are similar. But yes, I have a look, I've looked at individuals like Langston Hughes, uh, Maya Angelou, and I've like highlighted them and um, I've showed a video about them and we've seen some of their work. And then you look at some of the lines of like Langston Hughes poetry of hope deferred, it opens up a whole window of conversation to have with the students, right? What was he feeling? What was the backdrop? What was the experience of the, of the Black man during that time? And, and then finding that universal thread, hey, you wouldn't want to be treated that way. So, you know, no one should be treated that way. And I kind of look at it through the lens, Eddie, um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. was one of my heroes, right? Um, that, you know, you know, they would judge people not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. So through every injustice that the, the Black man faces or any minority, to find that universality of, hey, uh, we're all the same and no one deserves to be treated this way. And I think by, by doing that, you get buy-in from all minorities and races, as well as realizing, look, um, um, during the civil rights movement, you know, Blacks were not the only people promoting that movement. It was people of all colors and races. So just kind of seeing that connection that that the Black experience has with all of humanity, I think. Uh, that's what I try to do um, by sharing and, and, and teaching about these heroes and hope also getting buy-in from my students. That's awesome. So do you have any particular uh, literary uh, devices from them that you use? Like any specific poems or or books? Yeah. So again, um, a poem um, "Hope Deferred" by um, by um, by Langston Hughes. Also, um, "Life Doesn't Frighten Me at All" by Maya Angelou. And in our curriculum, it's a, it's a curriculum called Study Sync. There are particular passages on like Rosa Parks, uh, those um, Martin Luther King marching on Selma, and so there's like whole lessons um, that open the door to like rich conversation that we can talk about our history, talk about where we are and talk about where we want to go. So yeah, so those particular lessons I've used in the past and they've worked really well. So in your role, do you get a chance to advocate for the importance of diverse literature and representation in all English classrooms? Yeah, so I, I've i been a department chair uh, for the past, well, I, I've been a department chair for seven years. We currently have a, another department chair. And because of that, um, the books that we've read um, we've uh, we've had conversations about those, and so we have input on that. And even though I'm not the department chair now, our current department chair is amazing. And so any books that we feel passionate about that we want to add to the school, we can do right. And so um, there is that opportunity to do that. Um, and you know, we've had um, I think our current department uh, head just introduced some books on the Holocaust, right? And so you know, and so we and so we have that platform to share these things, these important works that we feel the students need to know. Well, it's great that the school has a environment of co collaboration on this stuff. So you're able to speak your voice and talk about the books you're passionate about and be able to bring those to the students. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give fellow educators on fostering a more culturally rich uh, English environment during Black History Month? Uh, yeah, I think I think some of the things that I was kind of mentioning <clears throat> in, 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 in some of the lessons that I like to share is that 
seeing that common thread of humanity, right? Um, so that as we as we in Black History Month, you know, as I'm going to share about these heroes, right? The Langston Hughes, the Rosa Parks, the Martin Luther King Juniors, and and recognizing um, all that they've done for us, and 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 what we as Black people have gone through to see, hey, there's a common thread of humanity and and and, and connection that we should all have. So that if if if, if Blacks are mistreated, it's not it's not a Black problem, right? Um, I'm trying to remember a quote by Martin Luther King, but it says that he said something to the effect of um, injustice allowed anywhere is injustice everywhere, something to that effect. And uh, and so I think to share these stories, but seeing how, hey, this could be you, this, this is a human issue, this is a human problem that all of us have a responsibility to try to solve, I think that opens the door to... Um, buy-in that opens the door to facilitating an environment where diverse people can feel included. All right. So we're going to get into the teacher recruitment phase of this podcast now. I need your elevator pitch. If you had to sell the education okay. profession for someone looking to get into it in one to two minutes, what would you tell them? One to two minutes. Yeah. So again, I think the financial issue, uh, I think is a big issue for those who want to get into the profession. But I think there's been some improvements. I think as recently in California, uh, teachers, I believe, had anywhere from like a 15 to 20% increase over the next five years in teaching. So that's been helpful. Again, talking about the um, the program from the, the state in California, how $25,000 extra over five years if you're teaching at a high need school and you are national board certified, also, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't bypass that two and a half months off you have over the summer. But more importantly, than all the finance and, and all the things that make your life nicer, is the impact that you make on students. We had, we've had like little fairs and things, and past students have come back, and and students come back and say, "Mr. I'm in college and I'm doing this and I'm doing that." And to me, that's more important than any amount of money that you can pay. Um, but that is my philosophy. I want to give back. And I think if you want to make a difference, a real difference in a life that's going to last, become an educator. All right. So last thing, like you, you saw those National Board Certified Teachers in your school and said you wanted to be like them. But we wanted to do a more direct way and let you shoulder tap a colleague and let them know they're ready to become National Board Certified. So here you'll give them a shout out and on social media, we'll encourage them to go through the process. So Barry Thomas, who are you shoulder tapping? Yeah, I am shoulder tapping my colleague, Christopher Winnell. Uh, he is a quality teacher, and uh, he is more than ready to begin his national board journey. All right, look out for that. Uh, Barry Thomas, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Thank you for your time. I really enjoyed it. Right. It was great to talk with Barry. It was a very insightful conversation. I want to thank him again for taking the time to chat with me, and thank you for listening to this episode of National Board Conversation. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. And we'll see you next time.